attend, live, and share their faith. Many of these viewers have faced serious problems, including cancer, the loss of loved ones, their children leaving the faith. And EWTN has helped them to face these challenges and find hope in our Lord. Thank you for helping to touch the lives of people around the world with the truth of the eternal word. May God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Your generosity helps people live truth, live Catholic through free faith-filled programs, Catholic devotions, and content. O oh God, I love you with my whole heart above all things, because you are infinitely good. And for your sake, I love my neighbor as I love myself. Amen. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, welcome to Scripture and Tradition. And of course, on this Easter Tuesday, I want to wish you, you know, a very blessed Easter season. Uh, throughout this season, people of the Eastern Church greet each other by saying, Christ is risen, and they respond, indeed, He is risen. So in Greek, is Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti. And we said at my parish, Messiah come, hak and come. And in all the other different languages of the East, they addressed us. So this is a great way for us to think of Easter and to celebrate, make it a proclamation that this is the resurrection of Jesus. Now, of course, we want you to be a part of this show. Uh, you can do so by adding your questions or comments, and you can do that during the live program, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number you can call if you are in North America is 1-800-221-9460. one 800 9460. If you are outside North America, you can call 205 271 2980. And again, it's country code 1 205 271 2980. Again, we encourage you to send us your questions and comments also by email. You can write to scripture and tradition at ewtn.com. Or you can go on our social media by going to facebook.com slash EWTN online or youtube.com slash EWTN. Now, we want to talk today a little bit more about how important it is for a closer reading and spiritual and prayerful reflection on Scripture and our acceptance of the Word of God sometimes can challenge us to the point of even making us a little uncomfortable. Uh, there'll be some unmodern principles that we have to take a look at, uh, sometimes principles that uh, are classical modern, they're, they're things like sola scriptura, use the Bible alone. And We'll see what's going on there. So we'll be starting on page 45 of my book, How to Listen When God is Speaking. 
A Guide for Modern Day Catholics. And you can still get that book by going to EWTNRC.com. That's Religious Catalog. It's item number 1833. All right. Now, I've been pushing us to accept that accepting sacred scripture is worthy of belief on so many levels. This is a tremendous thing. We, of course, we have to uh, understand other issues like modern science and, and try to see the ancient perspective, except that they're talking in a very ancient way, and yet they're also teaching some extremely important attitudes towards creation and towards the reality of being human that we very much need. And this is necessary also for the spiritual life of believers so that we grow, grow closer to God. We want to have a much more deep and personal knowledge and love of God. In fact, our love of God is more important than our knowledge, but our knowledge helps our love, just like it does with any other relationship. The more you know about somebody, the more you uh, make that choice to love them. And we will want to have this close, prayerful reading of Scripture as a way to enter more deeply into our relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's very key. And we should expect that as we listen to the Word of God, sacred scripture, as we listen to it more prayerfully, that we should expect to hear God speaking to our hearts, that He will address us. Um, but again, that assumes that we believe that the sacred scripture is the Word of God and not just a human word. And that is the very basic, most basic assumption of our life in the spiritual life. Now, again, we have to be prepared for a certain discomfort uh, every so often. Um, it's important to take Scripture on its own terms. I've been saying that throughout. One of the things that we have to keep in mind, sacred scripture never says that you use the Bible alone. That is not in scripture. No passage of the Bible says that you use the Bible alone. Anyone who claims to use the Bible alone is not basing that on sacred scripture but is basing that on a late tradition of men, as the Bible would say. Um, it, something else is that the Bible never says that you have to prove everything from the Bible alone. That is an unbiblical principle, and the Catholic Church does not consider that to be true. Um, one of the things that we... You can see to show that the Scripture tells us not to use the Bible alone. We use the Bible, absolutely. That this doesn't mean that you reject the Bible or ignore it. That would be as dumb an idea. But what does Scripture say about this? I like to begin with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Listen carefully. To Remember, 1 Thessalonians is the very first book of the New Testament actually to be written down. This was written in 51 AD as a letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Well, he was already in Corinth to the south. Uh, he wrote a letter up to the Thessalonians. And in chapter 2, verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians, he wrote, 
we also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word which is also at work in you believers. Notice this, that you heard the word of God and you accepted it as really being the word of God. They didn't read it because there was no New Testament written down. They had to hear it. And this is St. Paul saying that that word that he spoke in the oral tradition is the word of God. That's one starting point. Then we take a look at his second epistle to the Thessalonians, which you might guess is the second book of the New Testament to be written down. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now, this is very important because we see that the word that is used there is the word traditions. And this is something that um, you can find in the King James Bible and, of course, in the RSV and others. And that's because the word in Greek is paradosis. Excuse me, paradosis, paradosis. So paradosis means that which has been handed on. And what he is saying is stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. I think there was one translation that said hold on to the teachings, but that's a different word. That would be the dear case. This is paradoses, the traditions. And these traditions are considered God's revelation. And it's both what's written down and what is passed on by word of mouth. This is very uh, important. I remember, I think I've mentioned in some past programs that in a debate I did back in 1994 in Dallas, my interlocutor asked me, well, what is there in the tradition that's not already in the Bible, which is an admission of a very prin important principle in Catholicism, namely that the tradition the oral tradition of the apostles and the written tradition of the apostles are in consonance with each other. They don't contradict each other. They complement each other. But while admitting that point, he then said, well, what is there in the tradition that we don't already have in the scriptures? And I looked at the audience and said, the table of contents. No book of the Bible tells you what books go in the Bible. If it weren't for the oral tradition, you could not know which books go in the Bible. And especially during the first centuries of persecution, the different churches only had some of the New Testament books. Quite commonly, they had 22 books in their uh, New Testament, and not always the same 22. They, they varied among themselves, 
and their idea of the Old Testament also varied. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And we see that the Bible, therefore, is very much giving us this basis for understanding the tradition that it is part of our theology that we very much have this tradition. And as a matter of fact, I was just looking, there we go, um, that I was just taking a look at uh, some of the early fathers of the church. And you see people like St. Clement of Alexandria, writing about 200 A.D., had the four Gospels. He had 14 letters of St. Paul, included Hebrews in that. He had Acts, he had 1 Peter, 1 and 2 John, but he didn't have 2 Peter or 3 John. He had Jude and Revelations, but he didn't have James. So, you know, he had a different list. And same with St. Irenaeus. He had the four Gospels and 12 letters of Paul. He didn't have Philemon. Um, and he had... Uh, Hebrews with a certain amount of reservation. Tertullian had 13 epistles of Paul, uh, 1 John, 1 Peter, Jude, but he didn't have some of the other letters. They just didn't have all the list. But when you went to all the bishops, and finally after the persecution, they did go to all the bishops, and they could see this is what we have in all the churches. In fact, Alexandria was one of the few churches, along with Rome, to have all the books because there was a lot of communication with them. But it was hard during the persecution. But the bishops passed on what they had. And then when they could share that in synods in the 300s, after Constantine made peace with the church, that would be... Uh, what we have. And this brings out something else, that we also have the church and its magisterium. The church magisterium means its teaching authority. This is primarily in the pope and the bishops. Scripturally, the authority of the uh, magisterium goes back to our Lord Jesus. Think back to John chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus promised to send the Spirit of Truth, and he says, when the Spirit of Truth comes, he will lead you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So this is a promise he gives to the apostles at the Last Supper, and that the Spirit of Truth will guide them. That passage helps us to better understand the role of Peter in Matthew 16, verse 16 where Saint P, uh, Simon, still Simon, son of John, answered Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He makes this great confession of faith in who Jesus is. And that is something that Jesus, our Lord, recognized was a gift of the Father. He knew Peter well enough to know that Peter didn't come up with that on his own. And based on on that act of faith, he changed P, uh, Simon's name to Kepha. Kepha is Aramaic. We see that, for instance, in 1 John 42, and it means crag of rock. And when they transliterated into the New Testament in Greek, they put a Kephas because 
Greek doesn't like to end masculine words in the letter, uh, in the sound of ah, uh, the letter A, or uh, alpha, uh, because then it's, they assume that it's feminine if it ends in A. But in Aramaic, you can end, mas uh, especially uh, masculine words, with that ah sound. It's aleph. Um, and you, you see that uh, in John 1, 42, uh, when Simon's brother brought him to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon's son of John, you'll be called Kephas, which is translated Peter. This is key because it shows that the word letter, the name Petros means rock in Greek, and it translates Kepha. What does Kepha mean in Aramaic? It means a crag of rock. It doesn't mean a little stone, doesn't mean little rock, none of that. You know, some people come up with these arguments, um, but that's not what it means. And even Petra and Petros in Greek, have there, there are Greek poems outside the Bible where it means big rock and little rock for either one. So don't go with the idea that Petra is a big rock and Petros is a little rock. No, it has nothing to do with Arkansas. Nothing. Pay attention to the capital. Um, so no, 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 no. And the important thing is that <coughs> Simon Peter, Simon the Rock, is this crag of rock on which Jesus builds the church. And, that the, and, this is, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And furthermore, Peter gets the keys of the kingdom so that what he looses on earth is loosed in heaven. What he binds on earth is bound in heaven. This is his authority, and it is the Holy Spirit that will be leading him in binding and loosing. The Holy Spirit will make him the rock, and this is a very important element. All right, we'll come back to this. We need to take a break, but I want to come back to this point and take it just a little bit further and talk about the role of the rest of the apostles in this, so please stay with us. In times of trial and suffering, God's love meets us in a special way. Let us offer prayers of thanksgiving for the gift of His mercy. Join the Marians of the Immaculate Conception for a special preview from the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, followed by the Mass and Celebration of Divine Mercy from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It all begins Sunday at noon Eastern here on EWTN. Next time on EWTN Live, Wayne Altenbreit showcases how Catholic therapists are helping others by uniting faith and science in their counseling practices on the next EWTN Live. Hey, Mom, we learned rosary in school today. Oh, that's wonderful, dear. You want to say rosary with me? You have a whole bunch of them. I don't know. It's late and... All right. But it's been a long time since I've said a rosary. You'll have to help, okay? Okay. First you start in the name of the Father, Father and of the, the Son, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Hey, kid. I just wanted to say goodnight. Hey, Dad, you want to say a rosary with me and Mom? Well, there's, there's a game on. Yeah, sure. I'd like to. Mom, Dad, I'm going to Jenny's to listen to music. Hey, sis, you want to say a rosary with us? Um, no thanks. Maybe the music can wait. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died.
All right, so we are speaking about how our Savior Jesus promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit of truth would guide them into all truth. And that he specifically pointed out Peter as the rock on which he'd build the church with the power of the keys of the kingdom and the power to bind and loose. So the keys of the kingdom mean that he is a prime minister. In ancient Israel, the king would put the key of the palace on the shoulder of the prime minister to indicate that this, he now had that authority as prime minister. So our Lord does that with Peter. And then he gives him the power to bind and loose. This was a standard expression among the rabbis when they would send disciples out to deliver messages they were given the power to bind and loose as they uh, went uh, on their their uh, journey well jesus gives that to peter but it's not only saint peter we see in matthew 18 verse 18 that the lord addresses the other 11 well, he said in Matthew 16, uh, I give you the uh, power to bind and loose. I call you Peter. That's you singular in Greek too. But here in Matthew 18, verse 18, it says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. But the word there is Humais, as we would say here in Alabama, y'all, whatever y'all bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever y'all loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So this is something. Now, he doesn't change their names. He doesn't call them crags of rock. Um, doesn't promise to build the church on them the way he does on Peter. So they have a different kind of authority. But what we call the College of Apostles, this group of the apostles with Peter, have this authority to bind and loose. And this is why we also have church councils with the, the power to bind and loose various interpretations of Scripture uh, upon us. So that's one of the other things that we have. And having that authority that is in Peter and in the Apostles. And as the Second Vatican Council makes very clear, that it is an authority given to all the Apostles in union with the successor of St. Peter, namely the Pope of Rome. So that power to, for the Holy Spirit to lead them into truth and to bind and to loose different things, such as um, that we can now eat a ham sandwich, you know, that the kosher rules were loosed when Peter had a vision allowing, in fact, in fact ordering him to eat the unclean animals. Uh, that is a loosing of those kosher laws. And this is something that's key. And together, the bishops, in union with the Pope, have this authority to bind and loose and lead the church into all truth. And this is called the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. So you've got scripture, you've got the apostolic tradition, the tradition that goes back to the apostles, and we see that in their disciples in the early church. And then the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. These three elements, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and the church's magisterium, these are like three legs of a stool. And this is what holds us up. That may not be popular with a lot of people, but... This is extremely important. And in light of this, we can see and proclaim, Catholics proclaim strongly 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God. We take this as inspired. Notice not dictated. This, the Bible doesn't say that God dictated the scriptures. He inspired them. He used the biblical authors. That's why you can see as you, especially if you learn to read Greek and Hebrew, you can see the stylistic differences. Hosea writes with a northern dialect. Isaiah writes with the southern di dialect, as does Micah and other prophets. Jeremiah is from the border. So he has a mixture of northern and southern dialect of Hebrew. We see the not quite so well-educated Greek of St. Mark, but then the highly sophisticated Greek of St. Luke, the doctor. You know, and so the, we see these various, so the Holy Spirit used their gifts, and I used this image last week. It's like different kinds of cameras, that the Holy Spirit is the photographer. He takes the snapshot. But some cameras have different abilities and they get different perspectives and, and different levels of definition and such and different kinds of lenses. But it's the Holy Spirit who is the primary author inspiring them. And then we also see besides every word of Scripture is inspired of God, the sacred tradition is to be listened to from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. This is key. And then we have the church as the magisterium and its teaching authority to bind and loose. And that's where you see 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, which says, The church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. These aspects of the sacred scripture inspired by God, the sacred tradition from the apostolic times inspired by God, and the church of the living God, that's the pillar and bulwark of the truth, acting as a magisterium, a teaching authority. These are what we have to believe rather than all kinds of folks who say, no, 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 I have my interpretation. And I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to read it the way I want. No, 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 no. We enter into this world and learn from it. So, let me summarize this chapter. Because we're at the end of the chapter. Let me give you a summary of the three basic objective principles for learning how to listen to God speaking in his or her life. Okay? Basic, the most basic principles that we've been talking about. First of all, our commitment to God needs to be ahead of all other commitments. That is number one. We are committed to God ahead of everything else. Ahead of national, political party, economic, or even family, even self. This is what Christ calls us to do. That is necessary to be able to listen to God. Secondly, second objective principle, we must commit ourselves to getting to heaven and avoiding hell. And this demands that we listen to God correctly because you can't get to heaven if you believe that murdering people is acceptable. If you believe killing innocent children in their mother's wombs is okay, you're going to have to answer to God for that killing and that alliance with death. If you believe that killing the elderly is okay, then you are making an alliance with death, and that's wrong. So you, uh, you're not going to be able to listen to God if you aren't committed to getting to heaven. I'll do everything I have to do to get to heaven and avoid hell. Thirdly, third principle of objective truth, we must be committed 
and willing to accept God's revelation on his terms rather than our own. This will be the basic background. And what we will do next week is start the next chapter of this book, chapter 3. And in that chapter, we will start to go through subjective elements. What is it that I do subjectively to listen to God? So we've got the objective principles. Now we'll take a look at the subjective principles, which are uh, going to be very interesting. So hopefully you'll stay in with us for that. Until then, we have a caller on the line. Eileen, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Wonderful. Thank you for doing so. What is your question or comment? Well, the question is, you know, you always hear that God is so merciful, and we have Merciful Sunday coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't understand is our God could be so cruel to his son Jesus by making him suffer so much. For I know it's for us, but I don't understand how he can make his son suffer so much. Okay. First of all, I Eileen. I don't know how else to say that. It's confusing to me. Yeah, yeah. Eileen, take a look. Was God the Father inflicting those torments upon Jesus? Yes. He was? No, I didn't hear what you said quickly. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Uh, did God the Father inflict those tortures on Jesus? No, he just allowed it to happen. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. And there are lots of times. Do you have any children? Eileen? Yes, I have one son. Okay. And did you ever make your son go to the dentist? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. And did the dentist ever hurt your son? Well, I suppose, but actually... Yeah. That's probably not a good example for my son. He's got very, very good teeth. Okay, well, but you, know, even but when you he's get... Little, you, you get the idea that if you send somebody to the dentist and they have a cavity, you send them to go get hurt because that's the only way to fix their teeth. Or you send them to a doctor. They might send a son, I'm sure you had your son go to a doctor and get various shots at different times. And as I recall, uh, I used to hate and dread going to the doctor to get shots. But, you know, that my mother uh, put up with my whining, screaming, and crying uh, to get the um, Salk vaccines. And I kept wondering, why isn't it just one of these shots? You know, but there wasn't. There, was, there were three in those days. Uh, when they first came out. And she kept sending me back to get all three shots. And I just didn't understand. But that was what prevented me from perhaps getting polio, as well as my siblings. And sometimes a parent will allow a child to go through suffering. It's not that the parent likes to inflict pain, but it, parents know that there are times the only way to avoid grave danger is by the infliction of pain. And God the Father, you know, you know gave the Son, is, he certainly had a free will, uh, a free divine will and a free human will. But the Son also chose, not my will, but thy will be done. And so with that freedom, he also loved the world. And this is a, a very difficult thing, but 
This is what he allowed. While it was people making sinful choices, the different false witnesses who lied about Jesus, who misquoted Jesus, Judas, who was stealing and then seeking money and betraying Jesus, the soldiers who were mocking Jesus, uh, total lack of any sympathy, the crowds who were mocking him, all of these folks made the sinful choices, the cowardice of Pontius Pilate was a sinful choice to do what was unjust. There was, he knew that it was unjust and did it anyway. These are the sinful choices and Christ was willing to absorb that pain in order to redeem us from our sinful choices. And it's a difficult thing, but parents have done more, uh, just as many difficult things, sending sons, usually, but sometimes daughters, especially nowadays, off to war. You know, this is tough. tough. It tears the parent up, fills them with constant fear. Or sending off children, sons and daughters, to work in the, with the police to protect our society. But now, especially, we see how highly dangerous it is. These are all good examples of that uh, parents will allow that to happen for the sake of the good of society. And it's a tough choice, it really is. But the father didn't inflict the pain, but he set Christ in the place where he would experience the pain. And the son and the father were both in one mind and heart that this was necessary for us. And this is what is done. All right, but thank you for that. That's an important question, Eileen, very important. We appreciate you calling in. We'll take a break. We'll come back with more of your calls as well as emails, so please stay with us. family. At EWTN, we feel honored to share the love of Jesus Christ with you and millions of others around the world every day. We know that this work of evangelization is possible because of the providence of God. We can do nothing without Him. We also depend on your support to continue this mission. Through your donations, we can continue to share the daily Mass, live Eucharistic adoration, Sunday Vespers, faith-filled live shows, and news from a Catholic perspective. Every day, we get letters and email from viewers telling us how much they appreciate our programs and content that help them understand, live, and share their faith. Many of these viewers have faced serious problems, including cancer, the loss of loved ones, their children leaving the faith. And EWTN has helped them to face these challenges and find hope in our Lord. Thank you for helping to touch the lives of people around the world with the truth of the eternal word. May God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Your generosity helps people live truth, live Catholic through free faith-filled programs, Catholic devotions, and content. See who's coming to the Pinto House on At Home with Jim and Joy. Next time, Christina Simmons encourages Catholics to embrace saying yes to God's divine plan for their lives. At Home with Jim and Joy, here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.
All right, we have an email that is related to this season of the resurrection. This is from Moriah. And she says, Happy Easter. In the Gospel of Matthew 27, verse 52, it reads, Tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Would you please expound on this for me? Did the saints rise and walk into Jerusalem the same way Lazarus did? Or did they rise into the heavenly Jerusalem? Whom did they appear to? Humans, angels, or both? Did they ascend into heaven? Did they die again? Moriah. Well, A, there's not much said about them, but this is not them rising into the heavenly Jerusalem. It was the earthly Jerusalem. And that these folks appeared uh, in Jerusalem. And overall, <coughs> we believe that they may well have been assumed into heaven bodily. That, uh, you know, we believe that on the day of the resurrection, Christ opened up the gates of heaven. So we see in the creed that Christ descended to the dead. You know, Hella, or hell, uh, uh, he, he descended to hell, third day rose again from the dead. Uh, he descended to Hella, which is the place of the spirits of the dead. It's an old English word that is the old English equivalent of Hades, in Greek or Sheol in Hebrew. And that's where he went and preached. And then when he rose from the dead, um, this is uh, uh, something that opens up the gates of heaven. And since these resurrected people are still not around, we assume that they were taken up to heaven. So that's about as much as we know. All right. So, uh, we have a caller. Hello, Helen? Yes, good afternoon, Father Parkwa. Good afternoon. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from North Carolina, but I retired in this state. I'm not from here. But yeah, I'm I can tell. You don't have much of a southern North Carolina accent. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> Where are anyway, you from? Uh, I want to know, on one of your show, you had a guest that kind of proved that Jesus had been nailed on the cross to the wrist. Mm -hmm. Why the only people who were on the earth received the Jesus stigmata, uh, it seems to be in the hand? The, I have no idea why. Uh, the, um, you know, because that, that is where most of them experience the stigmata is in the palm of the hands. And now, uh, the, the, I believe the Shroud of Turin indicates the wrist. Um, so this is, uh, you know, something that is part of the mystical experience that stigmatists have. It's apparently not necessary for them to conform to, you know, the, um, the, the, what was most likely the way that it was done, you know, which is through the wrist. Um, and it, it's something that is meant for their spiritual growth. And for whatever reason, this is uh, why they experience it in the hand. Uh, could also be that if they were to have experienced it in the wrist, it may have been too painful for them. I wouldn't be surprised at that. That would be a very painful thing. So it, this is simply something I would leave uh, more in the realm of those people's spiritual experience rather than focus on historical uh, exactitude in regard to the stigmata. All right, and then we have another caller. Hello, Wanda. Wanda, are you there? I don't know if we have her. All right, so let me then go on. Let's see if we get, get her back there. Um, let's try. Um, 
uh, a uh, email from Susie. Yes, yeah, Susie, here we go. Uh, Dear Father Mitch, you always make clear that we are all called to evangelize the truth of Jesus with respect. I'm much more comfortable talking about the truth of the Catholic Church and Jesus' teaching about the need for the sacraments with my Protestant friends rather than with my Jewish friends. I know that they, too, need to believe in Jesus as the Savior in order to get to heaven, but they're raised and taught that he's not God's Son nor the Savior. How do we share the truth with them without disrespecting their culture? And will they truly not go to heaven if they do not believe that Jesus is the Savior? Will they be given a chance to accept Jesus perhaps at the final judgment? Susie. In terms of their uh, judgment, I'll leave that to God. I don't, I'm not in charge of that. You're not in charge of that. Uh, we'll leave that to our Lord. Our task is to be the uh, evangelist. That's why our Lord said not to judge. Don't worry about that. You're not the judge. Uh, he is. But we do want to find ways to evangelize. Now, there are a couple things to keep in mind. One is in addition to not believing in the Trinity, not believing that Jesus is God the Son, you also have to deal with the horrible ways Jewish people have been treated in history uh, by Christians. Um, overall, the popes were pretty careful to protect Jewish people, uh, protect them from persecution. But a lot of places they were terribly persecuted, and it was really terribly wrong. And uh, you know, conversion cannot be forced. But Europe was one of those types of societies where people um, didn't know how to deal with much diversity. So first of all, be ready to admit there's no justification for what had happened. Um, and you know this is not something that we want to exonerate. Uh, secondly, I focus, when I'm dealing with Jewish folk, I focus on the elements we hold in common. Start there. We need to build a conversation on what we ch share. And there are so many areas that we do share together. And partly it'll be building up friendship and the ease of being able to speak about our religious experience uh, without, you know, pushing things right away. Uh, it's learning to listen and understand what is in their hearts with God. And right now, frankly, a large portion of the Jewish community does not practice Judaism, but they will defend it if you attack it, but they may not practice it so much. And there are plenty of Catholics like that, too. Uh, so build up a, a, a reservoir of shared truth and values, and then see how in that spiritual friendship and that concern to be faithful to God, you then enter into dialogue and discussion. Take your time with it and be a, a good spiritual friend, uh, but don't be afraid to address some of the issues. And you may have to study a bit of Judaism to understand what their concerns are. Uh, defensive argumentation doesn't go very far. It's not a good idea. Um, but respectful conversation, understanding, and then sharing your faith. That may be helpful, okay? All right, and then we, oh, now we have Wanda. Wanda, are you there? Yes. Hi, what can we do for you today? Father, I am from Detroit. I have yeah. a daughter who's 39, well, 32, 
and she is questioning Catholicism. Okay. She believes in God. She went to Easter services with me. She did not want to go, but she went anyway. Okay. She says that she does not believe in Jesus as being Caucasian, as per, per, as as it says on TV or in the Bible. And I told her that there are different names of Jesus, from Hebrew to Greek. And in the New Testament, it has Jesus' name as being Jesus, but not in the Hebrew Bible. Um, I don't well, want her to lose to go to another denomination. Yeah, well, here's, here's one of the things. The Bible doesn't say anything about Jesus' race except that he is a descendant of David and that he belongs to the tribe of Judah or the people of Israel. There's, what is, why does she even bring up race? Is she a politician? What is this? You know, you don't need, there's nothing there that you want to bring up about race. It's, it's an irrelevant issue. The issue is that he fulfills the prophecies made to David uh, a thousand years before Jesus was born, and he fulfills the other prophecies, and he died for our sins, and he rose from the dead with lots of witnesses. Does she accept the testimony of those who not only claim that they saw Jesus, but they preferred to be executed rather than deny that they saw him raised from the dead and that this is for our salvation and eternal life. That's what's at stake, not some racial issue. So it sounds to me as if there's, um, you know, some of the things she has to uh, sift through and not see this through a politicized lens, but see the scriptures on their own terms. That's why I've been talking about this. You know, see, read the scripture on its own terms. All right, then let's go over to Evelyn in Florida. Hello, Evelyn, what's up? Hi, good, good afternoon, Father. I have a fourfold question on uh, masses that we offer. Yeah. Uh, now, this is a question that's coming from uh, my friend also. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the difference in the spiritual value of a mass that I, of, I attend and offer for my intention, uh -huh. or, I, or I buy a mass, I mean, I pay a small stipend and offer that mass for, the, uh, for a mass for, another for the same intention, or, yeah. as is now the trend, to offer masses for a whole year by way of a, a birthday sure. card or some anniversary card or the, something similar. Yeah. Okay, Evelyn, I only have a, a couple of seconds. Um, the masses are equally of infinite value because it's Jesus Christ who is offered. So it's a, but there is a special uh, plenary indulgence that goes with the Gregorian masses of 30 masses in a row uh, every day. Uh, and that's what you have there. Um, okay. But I am flat out of town. So the Lord bless you all and keep you the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you and blessed Easter season. Chaplet of Divine Mercy, next here on EWTN. I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, President Joe Biden is set to announce changes 
In when all adult Americans can get the COVID-19 vaccine, we're at the White House. And Cardinal Pietro Perilene, the Vatican Secretary of State, speaks out about euthanasia and abortion laws in Europe. Join us for news from a Catholic perspective. Give yourself over to God's saving love and forgiveness as the poor Claire nuns of perpetual adoration offer a divine mercy holy hour at Hansville, Alabama's Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. The Divine Mercy Holy Hour, Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern on EWTN.